Okay, I'm going to start by reading you out the extract from the Gospel from today, from the New Rite. St. Mark, chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. It was after John's arrest that Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the Gospel of God, saying, The time has come at last. The kingdom of God has arrived. You must change your hearts and minds and believe the good news. So this talk came about from pondering that gospel and then also someone was chatting to me about the difficulties they were experiencing living in the divine will. And they were saying how they really struggled with a couple of things. One is that as you start the volumes, it can appear that Jesus is a bit of a taskmaster. Secondly, it is very difficult. One feels that one is really being compressed. So the two together, I thought it would be useful to tackle the gospel and those comments to tackle this because it's going to be a constant question that we have. So I'm going to start firstly with the gospel and teaching of the church and I'm going to read an extract from Pope Benedict. And then I will look at how this ties in the, with the divine will. Now that little extract of St. Mark, like so often, St. Mark compresses a huge amount into a very small space of time. Give you a parallel example from Friday. Can't remember if it was Friday or Thursday when we have the appointment of the 12 apostles. If I just find it, one second. Later, Jesus went up the hillside and summoned the men whom he wanted, and they went up to him. He appointed a band of 12 to be his companions whom he could send out to preach with power to drive evil out evil spirits. Very simple sentence, but if you start pondering it, it has a huge amount in it. Notice what is the first reason Jesus appointed the apostles not to preach, not to heal, to be his companions. And that's so important in the divine will journey because it's a very hidden journey. We are his companions. We are keeping him company. And through that gift, the gift of the living in the divine will, we are keeping him company at the actual time he was undergoing his suffering. And we must always remember this. I think it was in one of the catechism podcasts they mentioned that quite often we think that what we do determines our mission, determines our identity. But it's not the case. Our mission flows from our identity. So as an example, how St. Mark, in a little phrase, if we ponder it, it opens up a huge change of outlook that we are first called to be Jesus' companions. Now, in this gospel passage of the Sunday, it's even simpler. He says simply, the kingdom of heaven has come close. Repent. So I'd like to talk a little bit about this in general, especially as regards prayer. And then either if we have time, we'll finish it off today or we will drift into next Sunday. Now, repent can mean a lot of things, but 
I think one of the most powerful ways that I've picked up is to think of repentance as 180 degrees about face. So the human will has us traipsing off in a particular direction. We're going merrily on our way. And even if that path is in the pursuit of good things, it can so often be determined by our own will, what we choose. And Jesus is telling us quite simply, stop, turn around. Okay, turn around. You've got to shift the way you're looking at these things. In fact, Tony Hickey says really this is the key to living the divine will, to suddenly realise it's all about no longer looking at us, but looking at Christ. So why do we turn around? What's the purpose? The purpose of turning around is so that we see the face of Christ. That's the purpose. If we're going in our direction, we can't see his face because he wants us to change, to repent, to face him. So often in the Gospels, this glance of Jesus is either sometimes directly, but a lot of times indirectly, the point in which people's lives are changed. Let's look at a few examples. The call of Matthew. I'm not going to spend time, I think I can remember it fairly well. Jesus was walking by. In fact, it is worth, I think, looking this up, if I can find it quickly. The call of Matthew. No, I'll leave it. But I think the drift of it is Jesus was walking by. He looked and said to Matthew, follow me. Now, a very simple phrase. He just looked, but we let us think what was in that glance. OK, what was in it? That must have been a glance so powerful, so transforming that Jesus's love and grace entered into the heart of Matthew. And it was that that enabled him to get up, leave everything behind and follow Jesus. The chosen do it very well. They have Jesus walking past the booth. He turns, looks at Matthew and says, follow me. Another example, St. Peter has denied Jesus. And I think it's in St. John's, maybe St. Luke's gospel, where you have the simple phrase that Jesus looked at Peter. So again, very simple, but what must have been in that look? The volume of mercy, of love, that Jesus, being God and man, communicated to Peter. So if you read the Gospels, there's lots of cases. Some are not directly written, but we can assume that this was the power. For example, the woman by the well. And the power of Jesus is a power that transforms and purifies us. So remember, the theme we're going to look at tonight is purification and prayer, how they all tie together. So Jesus's glance is one that purifies. Now, there's a beautiful section from Pope Benedict's encyclical on hope. Most encyclicals we call still by their Latin name. So this is called Spe Salvi saved by hope. And this is a very powerful extract. It's number 47. So I'm going to read it out. And remember the context. We're looking at 
The Gospel of Mark, Jesus has called us to repent. We're turning around so that we can look into the face of Christ. Benedict writes, Some recent theologians are of the, of the opinion that the fire which both burns and saves is Christ himself, the judge and saviour. The encounter with him is the decisive act of judgment. Before his gaze, all falsehood melts away. This encounter with him, as it burns us, transforms and frees us, allowing us to become truly ourselves. All that we build during our lives can prove to be mere straw, pure bluster, and it collapses. Yet in the pain of this encounter, when the impurity and sickness of our lives become evident to us, there lies salvation. His gaze, the touch of his heart, heals us through an undeniably painful transformation, as through fire. But it is a blessed pain in which the holy power of his love sears through us like a flame, enabling us to become totally ourselves and thus totally of God. Very powerful section, Space Salve 47. What is he saying here? This encounter with Christ is a purification. It's a transforming fire. It is the decisive act in encountering him that enables everything that is not of him and remember this is so often what we pray for in the divine will that the Holy Spirit burn away everything that is not of him. This is a common theme both in the Old and the New. In the Old Testament, I think it's Sirach chapter 2, where Sirach says, If you prepare to follow the Lord, be prepared for a trial of fire. This is something that is very unpopular today. And people often say comments like, you're going back to the bad old days, or this or that. But Pope Benedict is absolutely correct, because he's simply scriptural, that we cannot hope to be purified unless we are purified by fire. It is impossible. Now, Benedict, notice Pope Benedict, says, you know, it's undeniably a pain. But we have to remember there's different kinds of pain. And there's therefore different ways in which we welcome them. This is a pain which we welcome because although it's purifying us, it is something that we know is for our good and we know is going to bring about our transformation into who God created us to be. So again, another image that's often used in the Bible is that of childbirth. So I know we've got a lot of mums here that the pain of childbirth gives way when the child comes to the joy of the new child. So this is a pain that we welcome because it is the pain of the cross. It is the narrow road. Lots of saints use different phrases, but they all base it on the gospel when Jesus said, choose a narrow path. Or he said to the rich young man, if you want to follow me, go away, sell everything you own and come follow me. He was offering him at that moment a purification. Sinai, the giving of the law, was meant to be a purification for the Israelites. But they didn't accept it. They gave in. And what do we do when we don't want to be purified? We seek something to distract us from the pain. 
But the pain will always be there. It is transformative. It is necessary and it is good. Now, the place where this pain and transformation happens, because if you remember, I've mentioned last week, we're in the year of prayer when we're focused on prayer. We could call prayer of transformation, or we could call it mystical prayer. It is the cauldron where this is going to take place, where the gaze of Christ is going to purify us through the Holy Spirit. And remember that where we go in this journey, Jesus has already been. His sacred humanity also was transformed by the Holy Spirit. Now, what does this prayer look like? Well, in many ways, it's the simplest of prayers. What we are doing is we are entering into our room, our chamber. We are sitting silently before God. We are opening our hearts. And we are allowing the Lord to do his work. It's as simple as that. But this prayer of transformation is, as David Talkington said, probably the thing that has most caused the decline in the church. Now that's quite a statement. Many people have written about the condition of the church and come up with many different reasons, aspects and so on. What David Talkington says is, because we lost this prayer, we lost this transformation. Of course, we're generalizing. Many souls still undergo it. We have many great victim souls. We have many that are on this path. But as a whole, as a church, it is something that we have tended to lose and we need to rediscover it. Too often prayer can be overcomplicated. There can be all sorts of means and modes, tips, advice, which of course can serve their purpose if it helps. But David Talkington spent his life's books working on trying to get us to see again this prayer. Why then is this prayer so difficult? Why is it that Teresa of Avila said so few people undergo it? And remember, she didn't undergo it at the beginning. She, in fact, got so distracted by the life in the convent that her prayer became routine and ordinary. And Jesus gave her what she was later to call the greatest grace of her life. A vision of the place stored up to her in hell. And Teresa changed. She reformed her ways and became one of the great doctors of prayer. Now, the reason why it's so difficult is because what happens when we first start this is that we seem to be going backwards. Nothing seems to be happening. In fact, all our sinfulness seems to be coming more and more clear to us as dust is magnified when the light is shone through the window, we become acutely aware of what it means to be a sinner. Now this is different from simply knowing we're a sinner, going to confession. This is a vision of ourselves as God sees us and we really see what sin is. And therefore, this can be very off-putting and we can want to shut that down and we can want to retreat from it and we can seek ways around it. But again, another of you know of my favourite authors, Eras Erasmo Levi Maricarchus, in his book The Way of the Disciples, says it is at this time that we must allow all these things to come, to remain silent, to bear them, and let them gradually 
be burnt away. And when our weaknesses and our sinfulness is purified in this way, not only do temptations decline, but we are inoculated against those very weaknesses. Those sins cease to have an attraction for us. And this is another thing that is common amongst Catholics and I've heard even priests that I respect and I, I'm sure it was my view for a long time the image kind of well we're going to get to heaven and we're going to do our things but we fully expect during our life to be still going to confession and confessing the same old sins and some priests say well this is kind of normal one priest I very much like used to say, well, the good thing is about confessing the old sins is you're not committing any new ones. But that's not, that's not what our path in following Christ is meant to be. We're not called to be people who get by. He didn't die so that we could get by. He died so that we could be transformed. And again, the saints are clear on this. Let's take another saint who's very balanced and easy to read, St. Francis de Sales. In his book, Introduction to the Devout Life, he gives the soul ways in which it can first be freed from mortal sin, then from venial sin, and then from attachment to sin. The only thing we will be left with, as Teresa of Avila says, is inadvertent venial sin. So those sins that kind of take us by surprise. You know, someone stubs on our toe and we let out an expletive or something or some such. But we can't get to that state unless we undergo this battle, this fight which is so intense because we can't really do it with other people. We can be definitely supported by their prayers and we should have a guide. But the soul in the end has to face it alone and the guide can really only give encouragement. And it will take different forms for different people. And the other thing people forget, we all tend to forget, is sometimes we're undergoing this, but we don't actually realise that's what's happening. For example, let's take, let's imagine a parishioner comes and they've lost their job and they're having troubles in their marriage and this and that. And you actually need to point out to them, look, these aren't coincidences. You're being purified. You're being detached from those things that you've become dependent on. And so this purification, this what we can call dark night in the terms of St. John, is exactly what the early Christians called prayer. To an early Christian, prayer meant this type of prayer i'll take i'll take the question in a second ellie so because i'm going to stop i'm reaching a pause to stop so as saint benedict points out and as the scripture points out <clears throat> we have to get up through our heads and i'm just as bad as anyone that a battle means a battle a battle is not like just a nice comment for something which is a bit like a battle, but not too bad. And we sort of hardly noticed it and it passed. No, that is not what a battle is. A battle is when we feel pressed, constricted, powerless, clinging on to the Lord through a sheer strength of the will. When, as St. Therese said, she almost thought she had become a heretic. When other saints have said they thought they had lost the faith. It is a deep and powerful cleansing. And it is the inability to go through this 
And if you remember back to Derek's short talks, moving from Mansion 3 to 4, why so many souls stay in Mansion 3? But the good news is that, well, I'm not sure whether it's good news, but the other alternative is if we don't do that purification here on Earth, we will have to do it in purgatory, where the purification will be much more biting. Before I start for questions, I, I have a, a poet who I really, he's my fav, might even be my favourite poet, but certainly I think the greatest English poet of the 20th century, T.S. Eliot. He wrote a number of masterpieces, but from the perspective of the Christian journey, he wrote, first of all, The Wasteland, in which he was coming to terms, he hadn't yet reached faith, but he was coming to terms with the modern world and its decline and its lack of beauty, and he tackles many things. But then his, what I think is his masterpiece, the four quartets, go through the spiritual journey. And he has a beautiful phrase there. He says, we have to be transformed either by fire or fire, from pyre to pyre. Now, what is he saying there? Everybody, every single person in this world is going to suffer fire. There is no way around it. And there is a beautiful commentary by St. Hannibal that's relevant to this in the hours of the Passion. Now, I will try during question time to think of the reference. But what he says is, we're either going to be wounded, in other words, we're either going to suffer fire from human creatures where we give in to being pulled to them, or we are going to accept God's purification. If we don't accept God's purification, the wounds of creatures increases in us. If we accept God's purification, then they are purified. So T.S. Eliot's making it clear there's no other way. We either choose the fire of the Holy Spirit or we choose the fire of the world the flesh and the devil. St. Louis de Montfort said the same thing in his masterpiece, which again is something you might want to consider for Lent. It's very, very small. It's called Friends of the Cross, a little pamphlet. Where in that pamphlet he asks us to look at the three crosses on Calvary. The good thief, the bad thief, and in the middle Christ. He says everyone has to pick one of those crosses. There's no way around it. We either pick, God forbid, the cross of the bad thief and we end up suffering and we still end up losing our soul. Or we pick the cross of the good thief and we get in the last moment. <coughs> or we pick the cross of Christ. But we have to pick one. So it's very important, I think, to approach this, especially because we're going to move on after questions to look at how the divine will comes into this. We have not to be surprised if we feel that it is tough. So the first thing I say, do not be surprised. Do not think that it means you're doing something wrong if you're finding that you're being purified. Or if we use the image from Lord of the Rings, from the ring bearers, that they felt stretched. They felt stretched. Okay, that's a good pause to take some questions. And Ellie's had a hand up. Hi, Father and everyone. Um, yeah, I've got a question, but I think you you probably answered it. But if you just could summarize for me, um, so if you were saying about the pain, and if the pain is part of our lives, 
and has to be a part of our life. So what's the best way to befriend it? What's the best way to to like accept it and live with it? And I'll have another question. Right, well, we'll deal the first one. Um, the second one will require some remuneration because you only get one free. But the first, que the first question, let's remember two things. A wise Carthusian said in his book, They Speak by Silences, suffering will always remain suffering. So there is no technique, there is no way that will mean that suffering suddenly does not become suffering. It will remain that because it's purifying. The second thing is simply to embrace it. We have to embrace it. We have to not look at it as something to be got around, to be subdued, to be pacified. We have to just go wrap our arms around it and welcome it as a friend. Lastly, of course, and perhaps most importantly in what the divine will teachings tell us, is that if this is happening and we are placing everything in the divine will, that suffering eventually becomes a great source of joy and transformation. So that again in the retreat, Our Lady in the Kingdom of Heaven, it's round about 2930, the one on the resurrection, she makes it quite clear we had sufferings all through our lives. But in everything, the divine will triumphed. And I'm going to have a section relevant to that from a diary entry in the second half. So we have to reason, don't worry. Suffering will feel like suffering. There's no technique in the world that can make it otherwise. But if we embrace it, it becomes a friend. It becomes something we welcome. In fact, something eventually that we cannot do without. And thirdly, in our journey in the divine will, we will have, and Louisa says it, I think in the diary entry I've got here, she says eventually suffering ceases to be suffering. It actually ceases its means and motive. And that if something else continues after that, then it's for a different motive, which is then a victim soul. Um, so Louisa is quite clear. If, you, if we continue this on the, on the divine will journey, that suffering is transformed. The difficulty is at the beginning. Um, and we live in a world that certainly for me has made us quite soft in some ways. So it's more, a bit more difficult for us. Question two. So the, the, another one is about the confession. You were saying about different different sins, but we understand it differently now uh, as the time goes. So how how to tackle sins in the confession? Because I see wrong things and lack of purity behind every action, whether it's your, or most of the action, even in the past, and the way I haven't seen that. Um, and it just sometimes becomes impossible to express that because it's kind of like just laying on me um, in a confession. And and then the confession kind of like becomes a little bit like fake. I know it's not fake, but I'm just struggling to express, you know, what, what how I feel. Yeah, that, um, that's, that's, a good, that's a good point in the confession. Um, and again... If you're confessing about sins that arrive from the divine will, you obviously also have to either know the priest or explain to the priest why you're confessing these things. Otherwise, he might think you're bananas. What you, what you want to do simply in the confession is, after you've done the sin since your last confession, just simply say to the priest, I wish to confess the sins of my past, you may m mention one or two, because I am now more profoundly aware of the sinfulness of those actions and my guilt. Just put it like that. The priest is only intermediary. You're talking to Jesus. You're telling Jesus, look, Lord, I'm fully, I'm much more fully aware of 
how these sins impacted you and therefore I want to bring them to you again. Saint Benedict in the rule, I can't remember I read it today or yesterday, says constantly be sorry for your sins, for your sins. So that's the way to handle it in confession. Mike has a good comment. I asked Jesus to join with me in my sufferings and then my sufferings seem to be more manageable. If I deal it with, my, uh, with it on my own, I fail miserably. I would add, Mike, if you don't mind me, I'd add a little clarification on the next stage. What we, we move on after that, which is very good advice to the next stage, is that we, and perhaps this is what I should say to, said of, to Ellie, but it's just come to me from Mike's comment, is that we ha can't look at the sufferings as our own anymore. And this produces a great grace and a great ability because they're not our sufferings in the divine will we are allowing christ to suffer in us so if i paraphrase and i don't mean any criticism of mike's original comment i ask jesus i ask jesus that i fully join myself to his sufferings that are happening within me so that you lord may rest and I may shield you from your pain. So this is the great thing about the divine world. Do you remember we said it, I think, almost the one, it was a class after I just got back from Ejigori. We said, doing the acts in the divine will means we're, as it were, absorb, observing Jesus acting in us. So at the beginning, if we're walking to the shops, okay, at the beginning, before we know about the divine will, we might have made a morning offering. Very good. So walking to the shops is in that, it's covered by that. But now in the divine will, as we know, we walk into the shops, we may pray, Lord, I'm walking to the shops, come walk in my walking. I pray for all those who are taking their first steps today that may, they may be directed to your sacred heart. But then we realize too, Lord, you are walking in me. I am accompanying you to the shops. So this is very important because it then gives a huge um, consolation that our sufferings, whilst purifying us, are also in the divine will Christ suffering in us so that we are helping him they go together they go together which is why and this is a personal opinion but I think it's shared by others I think purification for those that are on the divine will journey will be much quicker and shorter than otherwise because I don't think that Jesus wants a soul seeking to live in his divine will to have the hardest, longest route. It, it just doesn't seem to me to go together. Good. Anyone else got anything they would like to to share? To Oh, sorry, I didn't see Robert. Um, you're not on my screen. You must be second screen. Robert? Uh no, it's Lori. It's Lorianne. All wife. right. Sorry. Okay. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, as we learn to pray in the divine will, um, we learn how Jesus taught Louisa, and her method, for instance, the rounds. Uh, they can become because they're. I can see putting them with meditation very easily. Because as Louisa went on rounds, she was looking and loving and praising. And we can very much get into the meditation with that. But what happens, and this is my question, when we start to move at times uh, to uh, affective prayer, or eventually prayer of quiet, where things are more internal, 
And those words just seem too wordy. And it seems that the divine will can be very wordy, as we know from Louise's many volumes. So trying to balance um, mental prayer that goes beyond that to the next stages with the, I have no other word for it, verbose um, way that Louisa did it. But I know why she, she did it, because we had to learn it. I understand, and I, and I respect it, and I respect the Lord for showing us, but I can't quite get the next step. <clears throat> okay, the, the next step is parallel to the purification that takes place in prayer. So the rounds and the acts will be part of our life always. We will never reach a stage where they will not but where you're quite right is the acts the rounds will become simpler less wordy almost a glance because mm. in the second stage of our journey in the spiritual journey and remember prayer changes as we progress spiritually god becomes the instigator the principle of our prayer so that mm. it tends to become less words wordy and we feel almost as if it is now jesus who is animating our prayer mm. Mm. now mm. this the next bit i'm going to say because this is still fairly new in how we're tackling this whole you know we don't have great guides written yet on prayer in the divine will or prayer related to a uh, traditional journey but mm -hmm. what i would say is that what will happen is that our rounds will become much more animated and instigated by jesus mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than our effective desires leading mm -hmm. them so that it will almost seem effortless mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Words don't even really describe it. It becomes mm. a complete mm. synthesis with one. But you're quite mm. right that we want to avoid, even in our rounds, being overly wordy. This is, this is something that Jesus himself says. So in our mm. rounds, remember always to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Mm. Mm. You know, think about What's he leading us to pray about? And also remember, we don't have to cover everything. It's Ooh. not like, rounds are not things like we have to go through, because you imagine if you had to go through every star, you'd be there for a billion years. So, and, But we can often be drawn into that temptation, thinking, right, I'm, I'm going to pray for all the set, I'm going to pray for all, I'm going to, and then we just feel this pressure that's not in the divine will. Jesus does the ex, um, expansion is not the word. Jesus does the multiplication. That's the word I'm looking for. He's the one that multiplies it. He's just using us. So at times when we're starting off, it's going to be a little bit more wordy. And at all times, as Teresa of Avila said, we may return to that because we can't pray on the highest level all the time. We have to go back and forth. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Father. Right, Susan? Um, oh, well, I, I'm just such a baby in the divine will. But I um, I've started reading the Book of Heaven and uh, just realizing that what pleases the Lord the most is to bring him souls. I thought, well, but that's going to involve a lot of suffering, and I don't want to suffer. And then I came across it, Volume 127. I've written it in my journal. Are you truly ready for anything? Jesus says to Louisa. And Louisa says, and I said, yes, I am ready and almost trembling. And he compassionately continued to tell me, do not fear, I will be your strength. It is not you who will suffer, but I myself will suffer and fight within. And that just really consoled me because I thought, I don't need to worry too much about suffering. Because the Lord, you know, as, uh, as we shared earlier, the Lord is suffering with us. So just thought I'd share that. Good. Can you just say, because I found it difficult, others might have found difficult to hear the reference. Um, I think it's because in the early 
pages of the of the Book of Heaven. There's not very clear references. Oh, okay. Is this volume one? Yes. Volume okay. One, page twenty-seven, I think. Okay. Um, I will. I yeah. will look that up, and um, maybe you, if you um, photo app it or whatever to me, I can get it somehow to others. But yeah, sure. what Susan read out is just what I was trying to say: is that the suffering is Jesus suffering within us and we almost begin to look at our lives as observing ourselves as jesus is working within us it's truly it's truly a remarkable remarkable journey just checking the um okay <clears throat> another good question here is is there any way to know that to know that you are living in the divine will or is it enough to just to desire it that's a very good question and require a longer talk very briefly is we can't know for certain and at times we will drift in and out but there are sure signs when we are progressing on the journey and the sure signs are that we become peaceful that is one of the great signs we do not have anxiety we do not have worry we feel always that we're living in surrender to the lord and this great peace pervades us to absolutely say whether we finally entered into the gift 24 7 i've not got there but i think you will notice in your life a change sin will almost be non-existent temptation will be almost non-existent i'm imagining this because i'm happy glad to get there but as louisa says there begins to be a freedom but what we have to remember is as with louisa she still had a journey after she got the gift she still has to go deeper and deeper. So our Lord was continually teaching her. And if there's no final question, that might be a good way just briefly to now move into um, uh, the reference now to how this applies to the divine will. Someone else wrote, this is quite a good um, analogy, a bit like cycling. We start pedaling and then Jesus continues pedaling. And we are freewheeling and rest. And we are still on the bike. Sometimes we pedal, but Jesus does it most of the times. <coughs> the other image perhaps is a musician. When a musician has practiced and practiced and become proficient and become an artist... They describe how the instrument becomes one with them. It is just an extension of them. And the thing that should keep us going in this is, wow, imagine we, God willing, and all we have to do is persevere to get there, that our life becomes that. It becomes one. We're no longer battling ourselves. We're no longer fighting ourselves we're no longer suffering in the sense of just purely purification we're not going to have time to do a great deal so i'm just going to say a few brief words about answering how this all started and i'm just going to use one passage tonight to answer those two original questions jesus can seem like a taskmaster yeah absolutely but if we use the word in the english language taskmaster it tends to have the connotation of someone that simply wants to tick boxes and is just looking at getting these and every job done jesus is a taskmaster in this sense that he loves us too much to leave us as we are that's why at times he seems to be very hard on Louisa. He seems very hard. And if we, uh, 
don't understand that this is mystical writing and therefore we have to see it in this way. Jesus can then seem to be someone that's kind of like prying into everything, wanting to control everything. Whereas all that is happening is he loves us and he knows there are aspects of our life we need to change. Therefore, he is a taskmaster. He doesn't want us just getting by. He's not going to let us be second best. He's not going to let us compromise. He's not going to let us go on having false motives. He's going to purify them all. And again, the image used in the Bible is the image of the discipline of the sun. Remember, a Roman... The son of a Roman, even if he was the heir, was still disciplined until he became the master of the house. And the, the Bible in many situations makes this clear that if we are sons of God, like our forefathers, it, it's in the um, divine office. It comes up in one of the uh, days in the readings of the little hours. When he said, or, or maybe it's the office of a, of a doctor of the church. He says, if our forefathers were purified, look at Abraham, look at Moses, look at David. Then we should follow their example. So Jesus is a taskmaster in the sense that he doesn't want us not to have the fullness of his life. So we are students. We are, in a sense, slaves at the beginning of the journey. We end up being friends, but we're slaves at, uh, at, the, at the beginning. So, yes, to answer the first one is it can seem like reading Louisa's diaries, if we don't understand them in this light, that Jesus is a taskmaster. But it's not. It's a loving father. He's the loving father through Jesus is not going to let us get away. And Mary says the same things. If you read her retreat, quite often she's saying, look, until you've given everything over to me, we're going to be separate. You know, I want you to be with me, but you can't be with me if you're going to hold on to these things. So thank God we've got a taskmaster. Thank God we've got somebody that's not going to let us simply be second best you know how many teachers destroy well no that's too harsh word how many teachers don't allow children to reach their or parents their children reach full potential because they don't want to push them they don't want to discipline them discipline's become a bad word it's become a word that people don't use but it, it's like disciple so the first thing is then, yes. The second thing is, what we'll pick up next Sunday, is the divine will is absolutely a pressure cooker. Louisa says, if I can find the text, so we better finish with a quote from Louisa. Do all this. Yeah, 7th of May, 7th of May, 1918, volume 12. 7th of May, 1918, volume 12. Continuing, and this is entitled, The Divine Will Grinds What is Human. Continuing in my usual state, my sweet Jesus told me, my daughter, if for a few days you do not see me as usual, do not afflict yourself. Evils will increase. Heaven and earth will unite in order to strike man. And I do not want to afflict you by making you see so many evils. And Jesus added, my daughter, do not be alarmed. I did not tell you I will not come at all, but not often. And I told you before so as not to make you worry. 
My will will compensate for everything because in my will, the human is ground down and I extract the flower, the fruit, the crafting of my will and I place it together with me to have a communal life. So the human like brand remains separated outside. Therefore, let the machine of my will grind you thoroughly so that nothing human may remain in you. So again, the divine will, just like the spiritual journey, we do feel constricted. We do feel that that's what how people describe it. We feel as if it's this. There's almost like no escape. We begin to think, I need a break. Oh, my human will is just being crushed. I, I, need, I need it to do something. I need to let it out. But it's this grinding, it's this purifying of the human will that's going to allow us to receive the gift fully. Okay, Isabel. Yes, I just wanted to share that um, because we are recognizing Jesus has done all our acts and has purified them beforehand and we thank him for that. That's the way we are, in a way, accompanying him because we're recognizing he has lived our life to purify it. He has purified our life already. So while we are purifying and fusing in the divine will, recognizing Jesus, and we do that incredible in the hours of the Passion, we are helping others. We're giving rest to Jesus because we are recognizing him. So he's resting, you know, his like mission with us is being fulfilled. And at the same time, we're helping others when we fuse in the divine will. So they can all so be docile to be purified. So, and also, of course, Mary and Risa, we're recognizing them also because they have paved the way for us also. And yes, we are crushed, but... If we are not crushed, we cannot be one with him. So it's a blessing to be crushed. Thanks, Isabel. That, that's, as always, when you speak, that's spot on. So again, I guess we're ending with what many human people would look at our conversation thinking these guys are all bananas. They're talking about being crushed purified oh my goodness what are these guys on are these masochists and go no th this is this is the glory that awaits us and remember book of hebrews tells us jesus himself underwent his sufferings for the sake of the glory that was stored up for him so what we do need in this is support that's what we can give each other is when people are suffering, they're being purified and they know that we as a community are praying for each other as a community, we know we're not alone in this and that we can bear each other's weight and we can encourage each other. Um, yeah, keep going, keep going. Don't stop. The end's in sight. So I thank you all as always, both Derek and I, we really appreciate your giving up your time. And we, we met at Walsingham uh, just recently and uh, just briefly. But there's, as far as we're concerned, there's nothing more important because if we can help others and they help us, we're accomplishing a greater help to the church now than anything else that can be done and i think the more we see this meltdown in the world of the church the more we just don't let it distract us from this keep keep going keep going okay so we will finish with a prayer and a blessing so firstly heavenly father we give you the glory for tonight, for all time, 
and we thank you that our ears have heard and our eyes have seen this final and this greatest grace. But you also know how weak we are. You know how liable we are to run away at the first sign of trouble. And you know without you we can do nothing. So as Louisa wrote in one version of the prayers after the hours, it's not in all the editions, it's in some, the prayer for after the hours of the Passion. So we pray this together tonight. Jesus, take us into our heart, into your heart. And if you see that we are about to leave it, encompassing us more tightly, do not allow us to leave your heart. We ask all of us journeying on this to give us the great grace of perseverance. Lord, you told us to persevere to the end. So all those both listening and present tonight, we offer a prayer and a blessing of strength, courage, fortitude, hope. We thank you not only for Louisa and Hannibal, but we think of our great priests that, and popes that have prepared us, and Pope Benedict and that great writing on hope. So on this Sunday of the word of the Lord, we thank you for your scripture. We thank you for Louisa's writing. And may the Lord, either in America, grant you a quiet day and a peaceful day and then the western side the eastern side will pray for a quiet night and a peaceful end and may jesus's blessing come upon you gathered the father the son and the holy spirit amen amen, amen.